Well, here we are, High Rollers. The 44th Annual World Series of Poker is down to its final table. The November 9, and here they are. J.C. Tran, your chip leader, Sacramento, California. He's got $38 million. Amir Lahavet from Israel, $29.7 million. Mark McLaughlin out of Quebec, Canada, $25.6 million. Jay Farber, Las Vegas, $25.9 million. Ryan Reese, East Lansing, Michigan, $25.8 million. Sylvain Loosely out of France, $19.6 million. Mikael Brunhaus, Amsterdam, Netherlands, $11.3 million. Don't think I got his name right, but I was close. Mark Newhouse, Las Vegas, $7.3 million. And the short stack... A very good player in David Benefield out of Arlington, Texas, $6.4 million. Hey, Degenerates, High Rollers, it's Derek Oliver here for Thank the Poker Gods, a High Roller presentation on the On Tilt Radio Network. And, yes, we are so glad to be broadcasting tonight on OTR. How about the final table bubble boy, 2001 main event champion, El Matador, Carlos Mortensen, Oh, so close to the final table, but his ace-nine could not hold up against J.C. Tran. All right, our guest tonight on Thank the Poker Gods, and yes, we do indeed thank the Poker Gods for this guy, Podrick Parkinson, an Irish legend, third of the 1999 main event, inaugural winner of Late Night Poker Across the Pond, one of the best storytellers in the business. My buddy, Podrick, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks, Derek. Thanks for filling me in on what's going on in the Rio. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm across the road in the Gold Coast. You know, I went over yesterday to take a look. I thought it, I, I, I'd arrived at a welder's convention. What do you mean by that? Explain. Well, there seems to be just a whole bunch of guys with, with sunglasses about twice the size of their faces. <laughs> sitting there looking like they, they were going to do something, but they weren't going to do it right now. And so... Uh, I, I I didn't hang around too long. You know, I, I think uh, they're going to have to do something about this. Well, you know what? Let, let me stop you there, and I will say this. I was following the action on WSOP.com yesterday, and they're playing from 27 down to 9. And it seemed like it took hours for each elimination. I mean, it was a long day. And I was surprised, quite frankly, when I got up this morning and I saw that they were down to nine because I fell asleep. So let's talk about it. You say something has to change in the game. Can you give us your, your theory on what has to change and why? Uh, well, I think, you know, there, only, there is only a poker game because people overestimate the, the amount of equity they have in us. You know, like 80% of poker players think if they enter a poker tournament that they're getting the best of it. Well, they're not. <laughs> but as long as they think they are, that's pretty good. Well, you hear all the time players talking about the main event as being one of the best value tournaments because supposedly there's so much dead money. Yeah, but... Um, Everybody thinks that. I mean, nobody thinks they're the dead money. <laughs> <laughs> Even the guys that are the dead money. No, I'm just making the point that, that we're in the entertainment business. And, um, you know, if you look at what happened to snooker uh, over the years when it became, you know, it became a big TV sport. But, uh, you know, the robots playing poker now have almost killed uh, TV on poker. You know, people only, w only want to watch it now when there's personalities playing. And, um, you know, they're going to kill the live game as well. I mean... Um, you know, like, don't get me wrong, I love the WSOP. I mean, it's, uh, it's very close to my heart. I haven't missed a day at, at the WSOP since 1995. But, uh, you know, what is slowing it down and killing it is uh, just the way people are behaving at the table. You know, uh, decisions are taken. I know it's, uh, a lot of people are, are saying this. You know, decisions are taking a ridiculous amount of time, especially decisions about nothing. Well, here's one of the problems that I see, that you do have these online players that are grinders, you know, eight hours a day, every day, online, and they're taught, I think, to, you know, wait 30 seconds for each uh, thought process, each deliberation, 30 seconds, then you make your decision, even if you've got seven deuce. And that's, their idea is not to give away any tells, but I think it's a bit ridiculous, which brings me to... Daniel Negreanu, who is very outspoken on the issue, the Canadian kid poker thinks that there should be a shot clock, and he thinks it should be self-policed, that if someone doesn't make a decision in one minute, players should automatically call the clock on them. Yeah, you know, um, there is the problem that, you know, 
you know, whereas a player can call the, the clock on the guy any time he feels like it, uh, guys don't like doing it. And they don't like and uh, like having it done to them. And, you know, some guys can get very pissed off about it. But uh, I think it has reached the stage where, you know, they're going to have to do something. Um, they're going to have to decide what's a reasonable amount of time for a guy to be taken. And if he's taken uh, too much time in every hand, well, then just put him on a shot clock. And I guess you see it uh, more often at the World Series of Poker simply because of the high stakes. I mean, you know, they're down to nine now, and they're playing for $8.4 million. That's a lot of money. So you're sitting there with pocket jacks, and you're facing a, a three bet. I mean, you might want to take more than the usual to think about that because it is life-altering money. Well, it might be a lot of life-altering money, but, I mean, you know, t- taking forever about a decision isn't necessarily going to make you come up with the best decision anyway. Do you have any ideas? On- I-, I have found over the years at the poker table that the decisions you make in, uh, in half a second uh, are a lot better than the decisions you make over three minutes. I mean... You know, I find it strange, too, because the online player does face, like, an 18-second, 15-second decision when they're playing online, and then they go to the live scene. No, but they're playing online, and they're probably playing 10 tables online. I mean, they can think 10 times as fast as that. And that's what I mean. And then they get to the live game, and all of a sudden they're taking 10 minutes. It doesn't seem right. No, it's nonsense. So have you got any ideas, Podrick, on uh, what can be done? You know, is shot clock the answer? Uh, Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, it would be nice if players sorted it out themselves and they just uh, got it into their heads that the correct poker et- etiquette was to, was to keep the game going. Uh, but I, I'm all against these shades as well. I, I think this has become absolutely ridiculous. You know, I mean, the very expression poker face, you know, it, it was supposed to relate to how somebody looked when they were bluffing or when they were uh, playing poker. Now you can't even see their faces because they're allowed to wear these big sunglasses that are covering them up. I mean... Uh, you know, it, it, it makes it uh, ridiculous uh, as a poker game. You know, if you, can't, if you can't look at the guys you're playing against because their faces are all covered up, uh, you're not really playing poker, are you? And here's the thing. I think a lot of the players that wear sunglasses, especially the top-notch players, perhaps they don't want to wear the glasses. They would prefer there being a rule against it. But since everyone else is doing it, they might as well because they don't want to give away any edge. Oh, yeah, oh, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't blame anybody for wearing sunglasses because, because you can wear sunglasses. I mean, you look but at a guy that's doing it and somebody does it just as a defensive measure. Uh, well, I don't have any problem with that, but I think the guys making the rules should just ban them and that's it. You know, make it, make a, make it a proper poker game. I mean, you're, you're pl- going to start coming in wearing suits of armor next or what? Like? <laughs> suits of armor. Wouldn't that be so? I mean, you're playing against the top guys all the time. You travel the World Poker Tour, seeing the EPT, the WSOP. You're sitting across from these guys. And, I mean, you look at a guy like Phil Locke, for instance, uh, perhaps the best known because of his antics on TV. But he's got the hoodie, the full hoodie, the sunglasses. You know, Dar- Dan- what's his name? Mignari? Dario, he's got the scarf. I mean, you can't see the guy. I mean, is the rule uh, is the rule to ban it all? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'd be all for that. I mean, uh, and uh, the, the, that rule actually has has uh, been enforced once. When we were doing, there was a TV uh, poker tournament called uh, Stars of Late Night Poker or something. That sounds about right. That, that, that we did in Ireland. And... Um, well, uh, I, I had some input into it. They asked, uh, well, what rules do you want to put in? I said, well, we're going to bar shades for a start. No shades, no hoodies. And um, now, guys either qualified for this online or they, um, or they were celebrities or invitees or whatever. So that nobody was actually putting up any cash. So like, only one guy objected, and we told him, that's fine, your objection's been noted, uh, and I would get someone else to play. <laughs> uh, he changed his mind. You think it would change the game much? How would it change the game if all of a sudden you were not allowed to wear sunglasses or hoodies? Uh, well, I think people would start um, interacting a bit more at the poker table. And uh, you could certainly, um, if some guy's going to put in a bet, you, could, you can look at him for a little while and uh, see how he feels about it. I mean, now you're looking at a guy, and all you can see is uh, this big, uh, these huge shades covering up his eyes and half his face. I mean, I, I don't think that's poker. I don't think it's the way the game was supposed to be played. And it certainly makes it very, very boring. 
All right, folks, we're on the line with Podrick Parkinson, third at the 99 main event, inaugural winner of Late Night Poker Across the Pond, an Irish legend and a storyteller. 888.com is his sponsor. And Podrick, uh, before we get back to the World Series of Poker, because I do want to talk about all of the ongoings at the Rio this year, I want to talk about uh, what's happening in Ireland with you, Poker for the Homeless, and this big tour that you did right across that country. Can you tell us about it? Oh, yeah, well, um... Myself, Scott Gray, who's, uh, who was also a final tablist at the, the WSOP uh, main event in 2002, uh, I was talking to him one day, and we were saying, um, you know, people kept, uh, any time I play a poker tournament in Ireland, people were saying, well, you know, you should come down and play in our game, and, and it, you know, we, we have a game on a Thursday, it's great fun, and why don't you come and do this, and why don't you come and do that, so uh, finally we called our bluff, and uh, thanks to 888. Uh, Scott and I did a two-week tour of you know, clubs and pubs and um, snooker halls and you know wherever they were playing poker around Ireland. Now it being Ireland, the two-week tour took three and a half weeks because we, we kept. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was fantastic, you know. Uh, it kind of uh, it reminded me of uh, you know why I fell in love with the game in the first place, you know because uh, you know the guys I was meeting. Um, you know, we were all over Ireland, like north, south, east, west. We got a game busted in Northern Ireland. It was fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, but the people we were meeting were, you know, the, the grassroots of the game, the people who love the game just for what it is. They're not making fortunes out of it. They're not making careers out of it. But, uh, but they love it, like. And, uh, you know, to see their enthusiasm and, uh, and all the crack we had, um, going around the place it, it, it was you know it really uh, inspired me again and I remember you know just how great a game uh, poker is well let's talk about you and how you got into this game uh, many years ago what was it Padraig when did you decide to play poker for a living um, I decided to play poker for a living when I, when I found out there was such a thing as a poker game <laughs> <laughs> well I kind of I played poker all the way through college and um, I, I, a few years, I worked for a few years, but I, after that I discovered the Eccentrics Club in Dublin. The Eccentrics Club? Yeah. That, that sounds about right for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But uh, it was very aptly named. You know, it was uh, Terry Rogers who brought uh, tournament poker to Europe. He was a big friend of Benny Binion's. Well, what's his name again? Uh, Terry Rogers. Okay. He was, he was an Irish bookmaker, but he, he was miles ahead of everybody else. Um, in, in what way, Padraig? Well, in 81, or it might have been 82, he brought uh, every big player in the world to, to Dublin to a place called uh, Killiney Castle and had, uh, you know, 10 days of tournaments. But everybody was there, you know, Doyle, Chip. That was the reason Stewie got his first passport. Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, he might have brought 50 people over, but 200 people would tell you they were there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the atmosphere at an event like that? Well, it's a very special time, isn't it? You know, you've got 10 days of poker, and you've got the very best in the world. Well, this, this was huge, I mean, because Kerry was such a great uh, publicist. And, uh, you know, he got all the journalists. I mean, you know, poker was nothing back then, but uh, the, the atmosphere of that thing was was unreal. I mean, these were all the biggest names in the world. And this is back, what, 81? I mean, poker's not uh, mainstream in any means at that no, time. No, no, no. It was, it, this, was, this was the start of it all. Um, now, we were playing a little bit of Hold'em in Trinity College in, uh, in, in the 70s, so it wasn't the start of Texas Hold'em in Europe, but it was, um, it, it was certainly the start of uh, poker tournaments. And, and the Irish Open came from that, and because uh, that was Terry's baby as well. And that, that's one of the bigger events in the world, isn't it? It's well publicized. You get everybody there. Yeah, well, it, well, it's the oldest tournament in Europe, so you know it's got all the history and all the characters, and you know over over the years, a lot of the the big the big name Americans have come over and spent some time with us. You know, it's it's you know poker in Ireland is tremendous fun. I mean, they've. You know, it's kind of fun first, and uh, and, and um, you know, a serious money-making venture second, which is all a bit fucked up. But that's the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about poker for the homeless, a uh, charity. Uh, I know it does great work. Tell us about that charity. Uh, poker for the homeless uh, started off about seven or eight years ago, and uh, like all good uh, Irish plans, it, it started in a bar. <laughs> 
think uh, I'd got fed up looking at all these guys in suits going around poker tournaments. So at about five or six o'clock in the morning, I mean, I know you know what what it's <laughs> five or six in the morning. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I just have to say that Padraig and I first met at the EPT London in the hotel lobby after a Poker Stars VIP party, and it was about five o'clock in the morning, and I think they booted us out. But you know what? It was a lot of fun. Anyway, go ahead. Poker for the homeless. Well, well I was kind of looking around at these guys in suits and stuff, but you know, everybody's trying to take something out of the game. Um, these days, you know, and there's guys that don't give a shit about poker, then they're in just seeing it as a business. So why don't we um, put, put a snout into the trough for, for people who've got nothing? Like, like, let's say the homeless. I said, well, somebody should start doing that. And there was a guy called Eamon Connolly there, and Fintan Gavin was there, and uh, Brendan, and they were, they were saying, well, yeah, we should do that. Well, why don't you? And I said, well, I didn't say I was going to do it. I said, somebody should. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Thankfully, the guys uh, the guys were all so drunk that they thought it was a good idea, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there wasn't like a, a normal bar idea in Ireland. It didn't get put on the back shelf. I mean, um, the, the guys just made sure we went ahead with it. So, uh, you know, we've been running events in Ireland for the last seven or eight years to raise money for the homeless. Um, you know, there's a guy called Brother Kevin who's absolutely unbelievable. Um, he feeds the you know the poor people in Dublin. You know every you know. He's one of those good guys that everyone sort of you know wants to be. Guy. He's yeah. Just, uh, you know I don't believe in God, but I but I believe in Brother Kevin. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. The guy is just uh, he's, he's just unbelievable, and it's, he, he runs the kind of operate. You know everybody gets fed. There's no questions asked. I mean that's the the mission statement. You know. And can we find the charity online? Yeah. It's um, the Capuchin Day Center in Dublin. Okay. But uh, it's one of these operations where, you know, um, when, when you raise money for them, 100% of it appears on the, on the table. The exactly, day. yeah. You know, there, there aren't professional fundraisers involved. Um, there's an awful, an awful lot of the work is done by volunteers. So, I mean, it's real good stuff. So, um, now we used to raise, like we've raised about a quarter of a million since we started because you know the Irish poker players are, are unbelievably generous. You know, and if you give them an opportunity, um, it's it's absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, just how kind people can be. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'll never hear a word said against Irish poker because uh, I've got the farm line. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I know their hearts are in the right place, so I'll never hear a word said against them. Well, let's talk about Irish poker. And by the way, folks, you're listening to Thank the Poker Gods on the On Tilt Radio Network. It's a presentation of High Roller Radio. I'm your host, Derek Oliver, and we're on the line with Irish legend Potterick Parkinson. Let's talk about the Irish poker scene at this year's World Series of Poker. I know it was a tough, uh, a tough summer for the folks from the UK. I think, what, maybe one, maybe two bracelets. Owen O'Day had that impressive run a year ago, but this year, not so much, Potterick. Uh, yeah, it, it was actually a very strange um, year for the Irish, because uh, I think... Um, <laughs> the Irish probably, as a group, probably tried harder than they've ever tried before. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, sometimes the balls... they got the saying in snooker, you know, that the balls don't forgive you. <laughs> 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 you know, so many of the guys who, who you know, might have been accused of partying too much in the past, you know, came out here and uh, you know, gave it everything. You know, there was a whole bunch of them staying in the one house. And it was ridiculous. You mean they actually came out here with the intention of behaving, and they did, but it didn't help their game. Exactly. <laughs> it actually did help their game. Man. They just got a bit unlucky. I think, you know, the, the, the guys that were staying in a house together, you know, there was guys coming and going. But, you know, but I think they finished, like, you know, 16th, 14th, 13th, 12th, 11th. 10th and 8th or something like that in, um, you know nearly every Irish guy made a show in somewhere yeah it's just when the ace king doesn't hold up against the queens it's that kind of tournament you know yeah well it, it, it was that kind of a tournament for the Irish team but you know to be fair to them uh, you know it, it could have been so much better um, you know if one or two situations had gone right and you know you, you got to hand it they tried their hearts at it and uh, I, I, I think they will do a lot better in the future because this is a whole novel idea, this trying bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, 
you know, there, there's a lot of very um, talented young players in Ireland now, and it's you know, it, it's it's good to see them knuckling down and you know and helping each other out, you know, in the way that the English guys did a few years ago, and that led to, you know, a generation of English guys, you know, they were all helping each other, and that seemed to inspire them. Yeah, well, one of the English guys right now to watch is Sam Trickett, man. That guy is deadly. Hey, listen, you mentioned about the shades and about the slow play, but can you assess the 44th Annual World Series of Poker overall, your thoughts on it, any surprises? I mean, Canadians won 10 bracelets. The final table, J.C. Tran is your chip leader. Do you play against any of these guys? Do you know anything about them? What are your thoughts? I don't have any. <laughs> well, uh, I thought that was a pretty good series. Obviously, uh, you know, Canada. I mean, got off to an unbelievable start, and it's but you know, it's a little bit like um, you know the Brits a few years ago. You know, when it, when a team, you know, you see this happen in in you know in Olympic sports and all that quite often. That you know when um, some members of a team or a group um, start to achieve or even overachieve. That they kind of drag everybody else along with them. Yeah, everyone starts to believe. You know, it's a bit like the, you know the Irish in 1999. It's that you know when you see guys that are you know that you're very familiar with, and um, you see well, you had three at the final table, did you not? Three Irish people at the final table in '99. Yeah, but you know we kind of fed off each other, and that you know you're looking across the, you know, a couple of tables across, and you're looking at some guy that you know you play with every week, and. Uh, you know, that, that, then the whole thing holds no fear for you. And I think in poker it kind of goes a bit like that, in that, uh, you know, the Canadians obviously inspired each other. Can you look back at, uh, you know, way back uh, when you started playing at the World Series of Poker, uh, at, at the Binions as compared to today at the Rio, what are the major differences? What's better and what's worse? Uh, <laughs> where do you want me to start? Well, talk about the atmosphere first of all. It was way more, was way more fun in um, in Binions. There's no doubt about that. There were more characters around. There was probably an awful lot more shady characters around. <laughs> no, I'm not. You know, but I'm, you know, some guys they look back in the old days. You know, and you think, uh, you know, everybody was a saint and it was always good fun. I mean, you know, a lot of shit got sorted out in the car park. Like, oh, I bet. <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of shady characters. And Did you ever fear for your, your safety when you played? Like, let's say you had a big score one night, like getting from the casino cashier's table back to your car, for instance? Uh, not any more so than I would in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I never felt too worried about, about it back then. But, you know, things, things were a lot more relaxed back then. There were more, everybody knew each other, which was a help. So everybody socialized together. And everybody knew that, you know, the staff was a lot smaller, you know, the numbers. So people knew the staff, and there were a lot of friendships, um, you know, that crossed the line between players, staff, organizers, and all of that. More of a family atmosphere. Hey, nice to see you again. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, you bump into some guy, I mean, who wouldn't speak to you in Binion. And he comes up to you over here now like you're, uh, you know, a, a long-lost friend. <laughs> you just see somebody, a connection back to the old days. And all of a sudden, your buddies. Can you describe for our listeners who have never been to a World Series of Poker what the room itself is like with all those tables? What it looks like when you walk into it? Um, God, it's uh, it's it's pretty intimidating. I mean, it's it's like a big airport hangar that just goes on, and there's just a sea of tables, one after the other, and after the you know, it's a. Uh, it's it's very daunting. I mean, there's tables for as far as you can see, and there's guys on microphones announcing this, that, and everything. You know, it's actually funny going into one of these rooms and thinking you got to play a poker tournament and beat everybody in the room. You're no <laughs> kidding, eh? God, I don't want to. So that's where that. you know your mental game comes into play, and you've just got to realize it's one table at a time, one hand at a time. You got to stay in the moment. But I mean, you're right. When you look around, and it's 480 poker tables deep. That is daunting, man. But you know, um, I was doing it. I interviewed Barney Boatman for Euro. Hey, Barney Boatman got his first bracelet. What was the atmosphere like that night? That must have been crazy. It was probably, it was as good as when Marty Smith won his bracelet, which was five or six years ago. I mean, Barney winning the bracelet was probably um, the most uh, it, it's the most popular bracelet of the series. 
Well, why is that? What, what, what is it about Barney that makes it so popular when he wins? I mean, I mean, I know he's been gunning it for it for a long time. He's come close, but he finally did it. Well, uh, he's just a very popular guy. Uh, you know, he tries his heart out. He's, he's totally enthusiastic about the game. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been trying for donkey's years to, to win a WSOP bracelet. He's probably tried harder than anybody. I know Barney sometimes gets a little bit upset when he thinks he doesn't get the respect he deserves. But, um, <laughs> though I wrote a blog about Barney for, for 888. Okay, what was the blog about? It was Barney Boatman, the heart of a champion. That, um, <laughs> <laughs> that there was sheer joy there when they saw Barney win it. And that maybe um, Barney, you know, he was more of a Roy Keane as a soccer player than a, than a Zidane. <laughs> I said he was a soccer player it had been Roy Keane you know that it wasn't all about an extravagant talent but it was about um, but winning it, it was about having the heart of a champion and um, and being the last guy standing when everybody else fell down and doing it out of, out of sheer willpower and I mean I think that's why people were so happy for Barney hey listen what did he do when he won I mean that's probably the one live stream I missed I did not see him win it uh, what was his reaction did he jump was he calm and cool what was it he, he was very calm because the, the vinyl table went on for hours on end and you know Barney had tremendous support you know and it was um uh, it, you know, Barney was on about a British rail. It wasn't uh, It wasn't just a British rail. I was there for a start, and I can promise you I'm not British. <laughs> but there were, uh, you know, there were a lot of Americans on the rail rooting for Barney. And just so many people have said to me since then, wasn't it great? I mean, nobody said, God, didn't Barney get really lucky? <laughs> no. <laughs> Anything like that. I mean, that's what makes the World Series of Poker so special. Moments like that when the rail comes together in the spirit of the game and everything seems to go right. Oh, you, you put that so well, Derek, because, you know, I've seen some final tables there where basically nobody in the Rio gives a shit who wins. <laughs> you know, there might be about eight people gathering around looking at a final table, and six of them are trying to borrow money. But, you, know, <laughs> again, you know, some guy gets to a final table that, you know, that people like and respect. And, uh, you know, and then you see what a great game poker can be. I mean, you know, you can forget all about billions back then. I mean, uh, you know, a final table at the Rio with... Uh, but with a real popular player or two there, I mean, that can be fantastic. What were your thoughts on Eric Lindgren winning his uh, bracelet this year? I know he's gone through some turmoil. Do you have any thoughts on that guy? On Eric? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I don't know Eric all that well, but uh, any time I've met Eric um, over the years and played poker with him, I found him to be respectful. And I found him to be a very good company, and I've also found him to be very funny. Now, I know he's had a whole load of bad press over the last year or two. I don't know how, how true any of it is. I think, you know, he, I think he may have a gambling problem, but I mean, I, I don't see that as a bad trait in the man. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I judge people by how I find them, and uh, yeah. I've always, Eric has always been very nice to me. Well, that was well I, said, Potter. I enjoyed his company, and. Um, I was quite happy to see him win a bracelet. <laughs> We're on the line with Podrick Parkinson, and Podrick, we've only got a minute or two left. This is Thank the Poker Gods, by the way, on the On Till Radio Network. I'm Derek Oliver, and this is my buddy Podrick. We've got the final table set, Podrick. J.C. Tran, the chip leader. David Benefield's pretty good, but he's on the short stack. You got Jay Farber out of Las Vegas. You got a Canadian in there, Mark McLaughlin. Wouldn't that be something? Make it 11 for the Canucks. You got any thoughts on the final? T Let me ask you do you like the three month break or the four month break till November? Um, no, I don't think very much of it. Uh, I don't think it benefits the player. I, I, I think it goes a little bit against, against the spirit of the game. Well, they're going to be hiring coaches because they're all guaranteed a whack load of money so they can afford to spend 30, 40, 50 grand on hiring the best possible coach to break it down for them and maybe change their play. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, uh, I know. Ono D didn't like it. I mean, because Ono knew what he was doing in in July. <laughs> but uh, you, you know, you're right. I mean, that the, all of a sudden, guys. I mean, uh, can afford to go off and get coached for three or four months. And you know, and any reads or tells the guys have picked up. Uh, you know, which is what the game is supposed to be all about. Uh, could be well out of. Um, Are you saying that Owen would have won the main event if not for the break? No, I'm just saying that Owen would have, would have preferred not to have the break. I don't know what was going to happen, and, and Owen is far too humble a man 
to be making that kind of a claim, but uh, I know he was happy to keep playing. But, you know, I mean, you're playing with guys for days, everybody's getting into the zone, and they're picking up bits and pieces about other guys, and now, you know, people go off doing simulations for months and have coaches and they study all the TV tapes. So basically you're playing, uh, you know, you can be playing a different guy down the line. Now, I, I know there were some benefits for players, but, uh, you know, with the... Um, you know, the amount of sponsorship from the internet going, you know, through the floor. You know, there isn't a huge amount of benefit for guys hanging around for three or four months trying to negotiate deals for themselves. You know, certainly no more so than they could have done in a day. Right. But, right. I, but I think this, I'm sure you probably agree with me on that. Absolutely. I mean, if you're, pl- like you say, it's about the player, the integrity of the game. They've been playing for days. They're in the zone. They've got to tell a guy it may win them the championship, and now all of a sudden a coach may erase that tell, and it's right back to ground zero. Do you think a big name like J.C. Tran's going to win it, or do you think a no-name like like a, a loose Leah Reese or a Broomhouse? Um, well, I think if J.C. Tran is there, because uh, – any time I've uh, come into contact with J.C. Tran, he's been a, a great ambassador for the game. He's, uh, you know, he's a very, he's a very nice, easygoing guy. He's very, very media friendly. So, uh, I'm and he's fun to watch. I mean, he's not the most outgoing guy, but he is fun to watch simply because of his demeanor. He can crack a joke. He can smile, but he can also call down a bluff with, say, Queen High, and be good. You know, he's that good. Yeah, he seems to have gone quiet for a couple of years. So I actually saw him around at the series. It was the first time I, I like I'd actually forgotten about him until I saw him a few weeks ago. I said, God, I haven't seen him about for a while. And I wonder what he's been up to. And then he pops up at the final table. I mean, it would have been great for the for poker if if Carlos. Had oh, wouldn't that have been something? Because you know, uh, Carlos would have been great for the media. You know, he's hugely entertaining to watch when he's playing because his his style is just so aggressive and so. Um, I mean, you know, he just asks so many questions. Yeah, I, I remember. He does it rather quickly, which kind of... <laughs> and, what, do you, what do you mean he asks so many questions? You mean he's trying to get the, the, the correct response so he knows what to do, whether to call or fold? He just plays so aggressively. I mean, he just... Um, oh, I see what you mean. He puts you to a test. I got gotcha. you. He has, he has you guessing every second hand. He's, yeah. He's, you know, he's a, he's a very nice guy, but a nightmare to play against because he does put you in all these. Well, you know, there was an article in Car Player Magazine not too long ago, and the title was, Mike the Mouth Claims to be the Second Greatest Tournament Poker Player All Time. And I was like, okay, i got to see who number one is. And Carlos Mortensen was his number one based on the amount of tournaments. This guy doesn't play too many. And yet he just gets the job done, and he almost made the final table again. Padraig, listen, we're out of time. I uh, really want to thank you for being a special guest tonight on Thank the Poker Gods. You're an Irish legend, you're a friend, and you're certainly a poker ambassador, and we certainly thank the poker gods for you, my friend. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> you like, I wrote that myself. You like that one? <laughs> How's your book coming along? It's coming along slowly and surely. It will be done, and you will be writing the forward, I promise. Oh, yeah, well, that, that would be a pleasure. My <laughs> Padraig Parkinson, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Rollers. You've been listening to Thank the Poker Gods, and we certainly appreciate it. And don't forget to check out our site, www.highrollerradio.net.